Well, uh, as we have uh, referred to uh, a couple of times during this morning, uh, OECD is running a uh, fairly new and uh, uh, new concept of project called uh, Education 2030, the future for education and skills, uh, which I've had the privilege to uh, chair the working groups related to, to that. Uh, and uh, from a very modest beginning, uh, of having, I believe it was six or eight nations on board, it has now expanded. And uh, the last meeting I chaired had more than 270 participants. Uh, that was some kind of a challenge, but also really rewarding. And this has uh, done that OECD in its meeting procedures have become rather innovative uh, as well. Well, the, this success has nothing to do with uh, the, the chairing. It has uh, something to do with skilled and dedicated staff, uh, a visionary approach from the OCD director as such, and the support of very important and dedicated uh, nations. Uh, we have invited uh, Secretary of State from Portugal, Mr. João Costa, who uh, is a dear friend to the Education 2030 uh, community, very productive in his uh, contributions. And uh, during this uh, uh, work together, he has also explained to me the ambition of reform in, uh, in, in, in Portugal, which I was absolutely amazed of. You have seen on Andreas' slides how Portugal is making significant progress uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in education. And this is due to this uh, de dedicated uh, reform uh, uh, ambitions that they have in, in, in Portugal. Uh, normally we d discuss this in, uh, in terms of uh, uh, balancing uh, incremental to systemic reform, balancing uh, uh, top-down to uh, bottom-up approaches. I believe that uh, Portugal has cleared this uh, agenda, taken it away, and done something entirely different, it's entirely unique. Uh, but the, I don't know if you'll touch upon that, Wow. Well, uh, but anyway, uh, the floor is yours, and you will have uh, the title ahead of you, uh, The Future for Education and Skills 2030. Thank you, Jorn. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation, and it's also a great pleasure to be back in an university for one day and not in the parliament or <laughs> in, in, some other, in some other more political space and to engage in a... In a in a more academic discussion. Um, what, uh, um, what we are doing in Portugal is, uh, and, and if we think of the, of the topic of this conference and then the topic of this session, uh, is being influenced by the OECD 2030 project. But I also think it's fair to say that what we are doing in Portugal influences the 2030 project as well. So there's this um, reciprocity in this, in this relation, which has been really challenging for us and, uh, and also very rewarding uh, when we see uh, many times that some of the issues we are discussing uh, inside, in-house in Portugal is actually the same topic that is being discussed in Japan, in, uh, in, uh, in Korea, in other parts of the world. So in a way, we don't feel isolated and th th this gives us the strength to go back home and, and work further. Uh, because as you all know, inducing change in education is always a very difficult topic. And it's a very difficult topic because there is this public quest for stability in education. Uh, and I think this is also common uh, in, in several countries. People claim for stability and say education should be stable for many, many years. And I have very mixed feelings about it because being a politician now, I have to say, yeah, we are looking for some stability, but things have to change. Uh, the rest of the world changed, like Andreas presented this morning, and our classrooms are still very much what they were when I was in school uh, uh, 35 years ago. And, uh, and, uh, and another thing is that if we, are, if we have some progress in Portugal, uh, I'm not as optimistic as Andreas when he talks about Portugal, and I will explain why, but if we have some progress in, in Portugal, it's also because there were several governments, uh, school headmasters, teachers, uh, foundations that didn't care about stability and they induced change. So if we have a network of school libraries, if we have a national plan for literacy, if we, have, uh, if we are making uh, uh, preschool 
accessible to all, all the kids in Portugal. Uh, the, the, the first step of each of the, of the policy makers that took these decisions could have been, let's not do that because this is instability. So uh, sometimes I say long live lack of stability because this is what makes us uh, have progress uh, in education. Let me give you just a bit uh, of a background. So for those of you who don't know the history of Portugal, we are still more or less baby democracy. We had a dictatorship until 74. So we have 44 years of democracy, which means that we have uh, 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 44 years of public, of public school. And uh, although there is a, a, a national pessimism about education, which I think is also common in other countries. Uh, schools are bad, teachers are bad, parents are bad, students are bad, the government obviously is bad, everything is bad, but then we have very, very nice results. And this is, this is data from the census that was done in 61, but in 74 the data were very, very similar, there were minor changes, and this is data from the, the last census in 2016. So, and this is just a couple of numbers. So, starting from the bottom, we had almost 26% of people in Portugal could not read and write in, in 74, and now we still have 5%, but we almost eradicated uh, illiteracy in, this, in these four decades. We had less than 1% of preschool attendance, and all in private uh, institutions. And now we have 88% of preschool attendance in, pub in the public system, uh, which is, which is a, a very good uh, evolution. Uh, we had the transition, so uh, school was compulsory only until fourth grade. And the transition rate for, for, for the second cycle was for fifth grade was seven, 0.5% and it's now, the numbers are even better now. We are uh, close to 92% if I'm not uh, mistaken. And the enrollment, this is really impressive, the enrollment in high school, so our 15 year olds uh, in 61, we had 1% of students in high school. In 74, we had 5% and now we are close to, this is also can be updated now, we are close to 85%. Uh, of high school enrollment. So this is a very big progress, as I said, made with lots of instability. Uh, it was this <laughs> instability that uh, uh, made us have this progress. Then we also have this uh, uh, constant and, uh, and subtle evolution in the, in the international test, especially in PISA, uh, but we are not happy. And we are not happy because we still face two major challenges in our, in our education system. Um, one is the rates of retention and uh, early dropout. They are still very high. Portugal has one of the highest retention rates in the countries we like to compare with. And, um, and the problem that these retention rates have has is that, first, it means that there are students who are not learning. Um, and, and this is a problem by itself, so there is no effective learning. So it's not, I, I always say this when I go to schools or, I, or when I talk with, uh, with our unions, with our uh, teacher representatives and parent societies, uh, I always say this is not a statistical problem. Uh, if we have 0% retention next year and students have not learned anything, we failed. So this, uh, this is about learning, this is about effective learning. And then the big, big problem is that the main predictors of school retention are poverty, the socioeconomic background of the family, and the mother's qualification. And, um, and sometimes, and this is our fight <laughs> and our battle in, the, in, the, in our government, sometimes this is seen as a fatality. There's nothing to be done. The rich students thrive, the poor students don't have the social or the home background to be able to succeed. And this is not fair. This is, and that's why I say this is a problem of social justice. If we have an education system that only serves the privileged ones, then the education system is failing its mission, this main mission, which is to promote social mobility. So even at the PISA results, when we see the PISA results, yeah, we are doing some improvement, but the gap between privileged and underprivileged children is still very, very high. 
and, and this is a big concern. When I, when I say there are one third of the students uh, do, not, uh, do not conclude high school, uh, it doesn't mean that one third never concludes, but they do not conclude in due time. So in the three years that they should, uh, they should conclude. So um, because of this, we designed a structured response. So retention is a number, but it's a very complex matter. And uh, so we, we designed a national program for promoting school achievement. Uh, and each of these balls is, is uh, one of the main areas of investment in these last three years. I will talk about the green ones, uh, not about the others, and, uh, and, uh, and tell you a bit what we are doing. Uh, but the idea is just to mention those I will not be talking about. Uh, we launched a big program on adult education and training, and this has to do with school retention because we know that when we bring the parents back to school uh, they uh, change their relation with school and their relation uh, with, the, with their, 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 their children. Um, we are investing on preschool and we need we, we redesigned the curriculum orientation for preschool uh, in, uh, in this spirit that uh, quality preschool is one of the main predictors of uh, school achievement in the early years, then from first grade on. Uh, we are investing a lot on uh, professional development, so we, we, we made a program for reinvesting on, on uh, teacher training in all the areas that, uh, that, uh, that are, we are focusing in. Uh, and I will not also not mention in detail, but I will touch on it, the education strategy for citizenship. And I will mention this because this, is, this, is, this relates with, with, with the other areas. So the points I will make, uh, the, 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 the areas I will be exploring in my presentation are this, the definition of a student profile, a new law for inclusive education, a our program on autonomy and curriculum flexibility, some changes in the, the way we do assessment, and uh, the definition of a core curriculum. So I will go through these uh, uh, green balls uh, as fast and clear as I can. <laughs> so let's start with the student profile. So how did we get to this question? Uh, on two sides. First, and the, luckily Andreas talked before me, we, are, we have this huge change in knowledge, in access to knowledge, in uh, the way uh, the technology evolved. So we have new challenges that we are uh, facing in uh, our contemporary world. So we need to think and ask the question, what is the goal of education right now? Is it the same it was in 74, in 82, uh, in the 60s? Uh, and this leads to some of the issues that uh, Andreas talked. The other thing was, uh, okay, we have a big problem of school achievement, school success, but we sometimes forget to ask, but what is a successful student? And then we limit the answer to a pass or fail dichotomy or to a grade. You are successful if you are a nine, but when you grow up, you will not be a nine, you will be an engineer, a musician, an astronaut, a painter. Uh, and, and so we have to identify the set of areas of competence that makes you uh, uh, be able to learn throughout your life and be successful as a citizen and as a professional or an academic when you, when you, when you grow up. So this was a very participated debate, the definition of the student profile. You will not find the subjects, the classical subjects uh, in here. And um, we identified these 10 areas of competence, language and text, information and communication, reasoning and problem solving, autonomy and personal development, critical and creative thinking, scientific and technological knowledge, interpersonal relationship, individual and collective well-being and health, aesthetic and artistic sensitivity, and body awareness and domain. So you see here it's a bit of a holistic approach to education. And then what we are inviting schools to do is to see how each of the subjects in school can be a, an active contribution to the development of these areas of competence. And you see that you find here 
scientific knowledge, but you also find the arts and you find social and emotional skills in this. So this is the view that you are not a complete and successful student if you know lots of things by heart, but you are not able to cooperate with others, or if you're not able to uh, think critically and you are not able to reason. This is very challenging for our school, so I, I will be painting you a very nice picture, but then I will also talk about the real life and how, how difficult it can be to implement uh, these things. Then, and this was for political, political calendar <laughs> reasons, we induced some uh, changes in our assessment model. So just to explain, our predecessors, uh, uh, the previous government had introduced very early exams on fourth grade, uh, 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 kids had national exams, which allowed to select them in terms of early vocational paths. And we disagreed <laughs> with this. Uh, it was not bringing any benefit on, on the system. So we changed the, the, the uh, and the idea is to match this with the student profile. We cannot want to, uh, uh, students who are critical, active, autonomous, uh, sensitive and then test them in memory only or only in the cognitive domain. So what we did was at a national scale we introduced in basic education up to ninth grade uh, new, new national assessment tools with uh, uh, mixing subjects, uh, hybrid items in the, in the assessment uh, uh, um, proofs that we, we have. Um, and also, this was the, the, the really changing thing in assessment. We introduced national performative assessment instruments. So we are assessing the arts and physical education. And this is a very important message for our schools. It means that assessing is, is not only pen and paper. It can also be performance, uh, expression, uh, enjoying some experience, being able to play uh, with the others. The logistics of this is very heavy, but the message we are passing on is very important. And also, uh, anti-PISA, we are showing, <laughs> I'm, I'm provoking Andres, we are showing that the curriculum is not only about literacy and mathematics. It's also about art, it's also about uh, 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 aesthetic sensitivity, it's about physical education. We need all this, and we need to have data about all this. Uh, another thing we, we did with these with this, uh, new assessment tools, instead of giving to the parents and the children and the teachers a grade, we are giving them a qualitative res uh, report. So they don't get a mark, they get a report saying, in Portuguese for instance, you're good in doing inferences, but your writing performance has problems in spelling, but not in the text organization. This is difficult also because, you know, the, some families get these two-page reports and they cannot read it uh, themselves. So we need mediation in the schools and we are also following up our schools in what they can do with these, uh, with these reports. Um, because even in our schools we have teachers say, well, this now doesn't count. This doesn't count for anything because there is no grade. Uh, so in the, in, the, in the training we are doing, we're also showing good practices of what can be done with the qualitative assessment. And inside the schools, with the new law on curriculum, we're inviting the schools to diversify the uh, uh, assessment instruments. So uh, we, we, we know the schools and we know that in many, many schools, the weight of tests is 85 percent, uh, including physical education in the, in the package. So uh, again, we, we are saying this thing, there, there are many, many other ways to assess the <coughs> students and this, this bias that a test is objective but a portfolio is not objective is just a bias and not an actual uh, uh, reasonable thing to, 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 to say. Then Together with the professional societies, we, we, we critically wanted teachers to be involved in this work. We uh, defined what we call the core or essential curriculum. So this, is our, this was our approach to do the curriculum downsizing that we needed. We have a huge problem 
of, uh, of, um, of lists and lists of facts and contents in our subjects. We did uh, first a national survey to all the teachers to tell us to report how they could work with the curriculum as it was. And there was wide consensus. The, 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 the syllabus of each subject was too heavy. And the, the, the burden of this was that uh, this blocked many of the things that we were requiring uh, teachers to do. First, to make learning effective, to include. A heavy curriculum is a tool for exclusion because those students that cannot follow it will just be left behind or be taken to other spaces in the school because they cannot follow their peers. Uh, it blocked interdisciplinary approach. Teachers did not have the time to collaborate and to think of cross-disciplinary uh, 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 projects. And it blocked project-based learning and, and active methodologies because they consume time to do a research, to do a, a peer collaboration. It's time consuming. And then they say, there's some one teacher in Portugal once told me, and I've always quoted for this, I want my, teach, my students to learn, but I, and, but I don't manage because I have to teach them the syllabus, <laughs> which is a contradiction, but it expresses this, this burden because then there will be an exam and, uh, and you have to make sure that you taught everything not to be accused by the families that you didn't teach that part that appears in the exam. But then the result is that students memorize, they forget uh, three days later, and this is not uh, effective learning. So um, what we did was we, we identified this core set of learnings for all the subjects in every year with the documents with exactly the same structure, making the link between each subject and this student profile that we identified. So also making explicit how geography and physics and mathematics can be a tool to develop this, the, this student profile with examples of strategies to be, uh, to be implemented. We also made sure that these teacher societies work together. So this was the first time it was done in Portugal that philosophy teachers knew what was being done in economy or in geography or in, <coughs> in, in language. Uh, so that we could avoid, for instance, the Industrial Revolution was being taught in English, geography, history, sociology, so on. And then we felt that there was no time, but we were repeating the same contents in, in many subjects. This was very, very difficult. It's very easy to identify that there is a, a weight problem in the curriculum. It's very, very difficult to take decisions because then we who work in universities come saying, my topic has to be there. Uh, I did this, this experiment with three friends who are historians, and I told them the problem. One of them was a, uh, an expert on contemporary history, and she said, yeah, the Romans and the Greeks, the ancient history that can be reduced. Then I talked with an archaeologist, and he said, yeah, Middle Age, uh, it's too much. Then I talked with a medievalist, and she said, contemporary history is not history, it's journalism, so you can delete that part. <laughs> so it's really difficult, it's really difficult to find consensus. But in general, considering that we produced more than, uh, uh, I think around 100 or 150 documents for all subjects uh, every year, uh, even in the public debate, there were two or three things. We have a big war on mathematics in Portugal, and that always creates noise. But apart from that, there was only a big debate about a book that was no longer a compulsory reading, although it was not a compulsory reading for 16 years. So, uh, <laughs> but this was the headlines of a newspaper. Then uh, one uh, important green ball <laughs> is the inclusive education. So. Together with the new law on curriculum, we approved, and it was published on the same day, a new law on inclusive education. And I always say that these two laws are, are siblings because one does not work with, without the other. The law, uh, we, ca we can have the most beautiful curriculum in the world, but if this curriculum is a tool for excluding some students, or is only designed for the elite students, who achieve anyway, uh, this will not be, uh, uh, this will not be good enough. And also, you can have very beautiful principles on inclusion, but if the curriculum is the tool that makes students go away, then we don't have uh, uh, a clear 
uh, inclusive uh, school. So what we did was first to depart, uh, so Portugal has very, very, very good levels of, of uh, integration of students with special needs. 98% of children with uh, special needs are in the school system and not in, uh, in uh, specific institutions for, for, for children with, with some kind of disability. And, um, but we have high rates of inclusion, low, uh, high rates of integration, low levels of inclusion. So many times these students are in school, but then they are in separate units or in separate spaces, or even in the class they have a special education teacher always with him so make sure that he doesn't disturb the others. So what we did with this new law was to shift from a um, clinical model on special needs, saying you're dyslexic, you have this thing, you are hyperactive, you have this, you have to an educational model. So we don't need clinical referencing. What we are doing, going to do is an a, a, a individualized and personalized program for each student, depending on the identification of where he or she has a, 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 a requires special attention, depending on the difficulties of each uh, child. Uh, and this way, this diploma, this, this law, is designed for everyone. Uh, 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 it's a bit this all students means all students. So some do not learn because of their uh, family background, others because they have some kind of cognitive or physical uh, 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 incapacity, others it's because you know they are refugees that just came in the country and they need another different approach. And, and this is really a change in the paradigm. Uh, what we are saying and the our, the representatives of special education teachers were not happy about it uh, for a while. What we are saying is one student with some kind of difficulty is every one student, is not the student of the special education teacher. And the special education teacher has a critical role here, very important role. He has to know the details of that case to be able to cooperate with other teachers in finding solutions to have these students in the classroom with all, uh, with all the others. Um, I'm almost finishing. Then the law on curriculum. So the big news on this law was, and we had a, a pilot project last year with an external evaluation by OECD, an external review by OECD. The, the news of this project is that we are giving the schools the freedom to uh, make the curriculum flexible, local, and to change the whole structure of school uh, uh, as they want. So they will not, you saw in one of the graphs that Portugal was one of the most centralized, you didn't look at Portugal, only we looked at the bar of Portugal. <laughs> but <laughs> the, 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 Portugal was one of the, the, the countries with the, I think actually the country with the lowest level of autonomy for teachers. So everything very centralized. So. What we are trying to do is to change that. So we are giving teachers and the schools the option to develop the curriculum freely. And what we had in the pilot last year, when we let, when we let the schools work, we had beautiful experiences. So we had science classes that were taught in the mountain and not in the classroom. We had moments in the week in which the, the different subjects merged to develop interdisciplinary projects. We had cooperations between schools and the local university to bring the scientists to school and to take the students to the university labs. Uh, we had uh, alternation of the organization, so weeks working in a classical way by subject, but then in the third week of the month, the students uh, doing a project in the, a thematic week, merging all the, all the subjects together. We had diversification of the assessment instruments in some of the schools. Uh, and after the pilot, we approved this as a law to make sure that this is now a tool for, 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 the, for, for each school. We, we have big resistance. We have big resistance. Uh, but what we decided to do was, it's not me as a government member that goes around the country talking about this. It's actually not true because I keep going around the country talking about this. But <laughs> most of the time what I do is to take schools with me. And then it's the schools. We are creating these school networks to make sure that everyone knows everyone's practice. 
and, and then we show that this is possible. This is not a dream of a politician or a, an Im invention by some expert on education from a university. This is something that some schools can do because they already did, but they did illegally. Uh, <laughs> and now we are bringing these, these, uh, these people uh, uh, to the legal space. <laughs> and um, and what, we, what we have, uh, we also put the technology, the reinforcement of the artistic component uh, uh, and the citizenship as, as part of the, of the curriculum. And this was important also because citizenship education had been uh, neglected for, for a couple of years, was elective. Uh, if a school wanted, uh, they did. If they didn't, they did not. And this is really crucial because linking this with the student profile and when we think of the big challenges that our students are going to face when they leave school, they have to do with citizenship. Climate changes, uh, discrimination, racism, intolerance, it's just we look around the world and we see that these are the really uh, uh, urgent topics uh, that these students have to be equipped to deal with. So the idea that you are very successful if you have very good grades in abstract mathematics, but then you cannot read a newspaper and, and, or a, a social network and know whether some news are fake or real, uh, it's creating an illusion or a delusion <laughs> for, uh, for students. That's why we wanted to integrate this in the curriculum. So we did this with the big contribution of this slide that you have, been, have seen before, also contributing to the design of this, of this, um, of this model uh, with the Portuguese uh, experience. And uh, for this to get where we are, uh, we needed um, several contributions. We needed uh, the contribution of many stakeholders in Portugal. So in all of these pieces that I showed you, we engage as many people as possible. Teachers, unions, student societies, private foundations that have an interest on education, psychologists, students themselves. That was something that we developed November 2016. We launched an initiative called the Student Voice and we invited students to participate in the decisions here and with Register in new law, the, the, we invite schools to develop regular instances of gathering the students and discuss with them the effectiveness of the pedagogical strategies uh, designed uh, uh, in each school. Um, also, at this more global scale, with OECD, but also with the United Nations and in several forums, we participate. Uh, we learned a lot from other countries' experiences, uh, what works and what doesn't work, where we want to go and where we don't want to go. We feel that this is a very urgent debate. Uh, we cannot take, we were discussing this at uh, lunch with Lars, and there's this, this this difficulty that we want to induce change, but the political cycles are what they are. Uh, we, we want to leave something done before we go away, uh, but then all the experts say, yeah, but change uh, public policy requires 10, 15 years. But uh, we saw what appeared in 2006 and those things have changed, so we need to work on this tension. And most of all, uh, and I keep saying this in Portugal, pedagogical innovation is not a goal for us. It's a tool. It's a tool for better learning and for more inclusion. And when we focus on inclusion, uh, every day that is lost is critical. And that's why I think this is an urgent debate. Because if we keep leaving some uh, uh, areas of our society excluded from education, uh, this is not something that can happen. We have to change it as quickly uh, as possible. Now, um, there, is, there are these common concerns, but most of all, uh, um, I think that uh, we have to face the challenges. We have challenges regarding assessment, the role of exams in, by the end of secondary uh, education, some misconceptions about the role of exams. Uh, we have teacher resistance sometimes. Uh, we have a um, public opinion that is very divided uh, uh, about this. 
but the strategy we used was to do this gradually, progressively, and involving as many stakeholders as possible. And now in the law, we put some specific dates for intermediate reviews and the massive evaluation of these public policies in a six-year period to, to, to know more about where we're heading. So this is a bit the picture of what we're doing right now. Thank you for your attention.